Okay, um, thanks, for, thanks very much for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Irina. Um, she's from the Burnett Institute, where she runs her own group. I first knew Irina uh, at the WeHi when she did her first postdoc, and she was identifying new dendritic cell uh, receptors. Um, and she's still doing it, because that's what she really loves. And she specifically told me that there's no need to go into any embarrassing stories or biographies or stuff like that. And she's a, really a researcher after my own heart. She just really wants you to hear what she's got to say. Without further ado, Irina. So thank you very much for coming today. And I'll be talking about the topic of pathogen recognition receptors. I have a lot of personal biases, which I'll introduce into this talk. Um, but to start with, if you do want to do further reading, the authors that I highly recommend is um, anything written by Catano Rhesusus group. They sort of align with the way I think about C-type lectins. Um, but also a good review by Vandenberg is available on C-type lectins. Now, it's very important for the immune system to recognize um, pathogens, and the in innate immune system is our first line of defense. Now, the inna innate immune system has an array of receptors, or <coughs> pathogen recognition receptors, that detect pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMs, as they are abbreviated as. And there is essentially four groups of um, pathogen recognition receptors. You've got your toll-like receptors, you've got your retinoic acid-inducible genes, NLRs, or the nod-like receptors. And in that other group that I'll be talking about is a C-type lectin. So it's only one of four different ways that the immune system has to recognize invading pathogens. The aim of the game is, as soon as recognition occurs, is there is an immediate response and the induction of inflammatory responses. So let's start with definitions. What exactly are C-type lectins? Originally, the term was coined to discuss a group of animal proteins that could recognize carbohydrates. That's the lectins. They recognize carbohydrates. And when they do it in a calcium-dependent manner, they are C-type lectins. And this is a picture here of a carbohydrate recognition domain. In other words, the domain that is involved in the recognition of carbohydrates, sugars. The problem is these um, receptors were identified a long, long time ago. And since then, there's been an explosion of new molecules that have been identified, both in terms of the structural components that they have and in the functions that they have. And it clearly became obvious that C-type lectins are actually a diverse group and through evolution have changed some of their functions and no longer necessarily recognize just sugars. So the, the new term that was coined was C-type lectin-like domain. And that's to acknowledge the fact that this lectin domain has changed somewhat and it doesn't have to recognize carbohydrates. It can recognize lipids or proteins. The problem is that term is a big mouthful. So consequently, incorrectly in the literature, you will constantly refer to um, C-type lectin receptors. And what you really mean is any protein that has a C-type lectin-like domain um, with this particular structure. And just to give you an idea how diverse C-type lectin receptors or C-type lectins actually are, um, oh, by the way, sorry, I also need to mention that also in the literature, you'll have a reference to myeloid C-type lectin receptors. So C-type lectins are actually a group of 17 types of proteins, and there is at least a thousand members, a lot of them. And you can imagine that as such a diverse group of proteins, they're involved in many, many different cellular functions. Cell adhesion, uh, involved in natural killer cell regulation, complement activation, tissue remodeling, platelet activation, endocytosis, phagocytosis, and of course the immune um, response, and especially the innate immune response. But when we talk about c lectin like receptors or c lectin receptors, we are actually only referring to three of the 17 groups highlighted here. Okay, so group number two is 
um, divided into those that have one cytoplectin-like domain and they bind carbohydrates in a calcium-dependent manner, it's kind of like the classical cytoplectin. Group number five has ligands but binds them in a calcium-independent manner still via this carbohydrate recognition domain. And then group number six here has many, many cytoplectin-like domains and may or may not utilize calcium in its binding. In this group, famous members include DC Sine and Langer and Dectin 2. In this group, you might have heard of clec 9 a Dectin 1 and LOX1. Minkle sits in between. It does it both ways. And then there is this group that includes Dectoy 5, you may have heard about, and the mannose receptor. Okay, so the first division, conceptual division about all these lectins is to focus on the type of structure that they have and the ligand that they bind. So this is, gives basis to this group two, five, and six division. But Caetano Rhesusus's group have taken a different view on the C-type lectin receptors, and they have focused on their capacity to signal. So, okay, whatever structure that they have at this stage, somewhere along the line there must be consequences of that structure, like binding a ligand, and they are thinking that that consequence is signaling. So they're looking and dividing C-type lectin receptors into four groups. The first group are the lectins that have a motif that endows them with the ability to signal immediately upon, ligand, um, upon binding the ligand. The second group can also signal, but they do it through adapter molecules. So um, I'll give you examples of, of one such molecule, but typically it's the FC common gamma chain, a molecule that they will signal through. The third group are the lectins that have an inhibitory motif. Now, because I'm talking about pathogen recognition receptors, you can see that the inhibitory receptors aren't really part of my talk today. And in all fairness, I think we're still in the infancy in trying to understand exactly the role that these receptors play in modulating immune responses. The fourth group, they call ITAM, ITIM independent. I think that's a fancy name for saying we don't know if they signal. They probably don't. Okay, so this is a group that doesn't signal. So I showed you how the nomenclature looks at C-type lectins. I showed you how Katana Rhesus Suvis groups looks at uh, C-type lectins. Now I'm going to show you how I look at them, which is kind of combining everybody's work together. And I'm starting from the premise that C-type lectins can recognize microbial components or da uh, damage-associated molecular patterns, and there's going to be three consequences. First, they can act like strict PRRs. In other words, Upon, ligand, uh, upon binding their ligand, they'll immediately signal and they will activate the innate immune system and also the adaptive immune system. That's number one. Number two is they won't actually necessarily play a key role in activation as much as they will in modulating. So they can either serve to dampen, which I don't discuss today, or they, solve to, they serve to alter the adaptive or innate immune response. So more focus on modulating. And in a way, it's kind of fine-tuning your immune response to the pathogen that's being recognized. The third consequence of ligating one of these receptors might have nothing to do with activation at all. It may have to do with the inherent capacity of these receptors to endocytose, and then to direct cargo to different compartments and facilitate very, very good antigen presentation. So that's the third um, category of uh, lectins that I'm looking at. Now, the C-type lectin um, dilemma for me when I was preparing this talk is that it's full of beautiful, beautiful concepts that are extremely difficult to prove. And the problem is that you have many, many lectins, and many, many lectins can interact with many, many different pathogens. And when you knock out one of these lectins, it's going to be very difficult for you to see a biological consequence when one receptor is missing, when you have so many other receptors that can also do the same job. That's a fancy word for redundancy. So I just want to highlight this 
and to show you just how much they overlap in their ability to recognize pathogens. Here you've got DC sign, very, oops, I beg your pardon, that's if I, okay. You've got DC sign, very famous C-type lectin, and look at the list of things that it can recognize. And I'll focus on mycobacterium because it highlights nicely that DC sign recognizes it, Dectin 2 does, so does uh, the mannose receptor, and DC sign R1 does, and Dectin 1 does. There's a whole host of them. And not only do they all recognize different components of mycobacterium, but they all themselves recognize different types of pathogens. So look at the kind of specificity that Dectin 1 has here and um, the mannose receptor. So there's a lot of overlapping recognition, which makes it very, very difficult to have nice, crisp, definitive proof that they are essential to raising um, innate immune responses. Now, with all those caveats aside, I want to start focusing on the C-type lectins that can, in fact, act as strict pathogen recognition receptors and give you an example how this might work. My first example is Dectin-1. It's probably the very best studied molecule, and it's a classical PRR. And what I mean by that will become obvious in a second. So Dectin-1 is expressed on myeloid cells, including dendritic cells, macrophages, monocytes, neutrophils, and some other cells. And you can see the similar kind of um, expression pattern on human cells. Dectin-1 recognizes beta-glucans. And beta-glucans are in the cell walls of fungi and some bacteria, and some examples are listed here. Now, Dectin-1 does not have a typical um, CRD, calcium recognition domain, uh, sorry, carbohydrate recognition domain, but it does bind a sugar. It does so independently of calcium and lacks the motif that are normally associated with other binding mannose or galactose. What makes Dectin-1 so, Dectin so special is this motif here, this hemitam, half an item motif, which can directly recruit sick. And what's special is that upon this recruiting, you have immediate um, signaling events that lead to cytokine um, expression. And that's unique to Dectin-1. The signaling cascade is very, very complicated, and I'm not an expert in signaling, but I would like to highlight some of the very important um, signaling pathways that Dectin-1 ligation results in. First of all, Dectin-1, as I said, recruits sick, as you can see here, which then results in the activation of the CARD9 complex and canonical NF-kappa-B signaling, and therefore cytokine production. Furthermore, Dectin-1 can also activate the non-canonical NF-kappa-B pathway, the RELB, and that's CARD-9 independent, shown here. In humans, the Dectin-1 has been shown to signal via RAF1, we've got here. And furthermore, there's also activation of P38, ERK, junk, and NFAT. SICK induces production of reactive oxygen species, which are directly microbiosis microbicidal, and they can also activate NALP3 and result in secretion of IL-1 beta. The other point that I need to highlight is that different cell types will have different amounts of these signaling components, and consequently you may see that signaling varies between different cell types when Dectin-1 is engaged. So what are the consequences of Dectin-1 engagement? First of all, we've got phagocytosis. And you can actually see that um, when Dectin-1 binds zymosin, it forms these pseudopods ready for engulfing it and taking it up. The next thing, as I mentioned to the respiratory burst, the production of ROS. And then the other very important component is that Dectin-1 can directly result in the activation of the dendritic cells that have come in contact with the ligand. And that's important because an activated DC is in a prime state to facilitate the activation, proper activation of CD4 T cell helper cells, which then activate and help the activation of cytotoxic T cells and also support a very strong antibody response. What's interesting is the Dectin-1 ligation will also induce Th17 type cells. And that's interesting because 
it is the TH17 cells that have been associated with protection against fungal infections, so particularly against mucocutaneous candidiasis. So the real question then, so much circumstantial evidence, is Dectin-1 actually involved in antifungal immunity? Well, initially, the answer was yes, maybe, because in one system we see a Dectin-1 Dectin dependence and in another system we don't. But most recently, there's been a report by um, Simon Gordon's group and they've actually clarified the issue. And the answer is Dectin-1 mice are in fact more susceptible, Dectin-1 knockout mice are in fact more susceptible to certain strains of C. albicans of the yeast. And here is some of their data. This is one strain, and this strain requires Dectin-1 for having protection because C. adef wild types have Dectin-1 and they are relatively protected, whereas the knockouts are not protected, and they succumb to infection with this strain of, um, of yeast. Whereas this strain here seems to be independent of Dectin-1. What I like about this group is that they went back and tried to answer why there is sometimes a Dectin-1 dependence and not in other instances. And what they found was that the different strains of um, the yeast actually vary in the architecture of their cell wall, such that this strain here has very high levels of chitin. Didn't even know what that was, but there you are. It's got high levels of chitin. And what seems to happen is that when there is high levels of chitin, that in itself may be recognized by other pathogen recognition receptors, therefore making the recognition by Dectin-1 redundant. So that's great for mice. What about humans? Because that kind of matters too, right? Well, the answer is kind of fortuitous because fortuitous for us and very unfortunate for the poor family who has four family members who are effectively Dectin-1 knockout. And what they found was that this particular family, it's actually the females that have a problem, um, that don't have Dectin-1, they have defective IL-17 production and a reoccurrent uh, form of um, candiditis and a special form of the kind of um, infection that you see in the nail bed. So I've got a picture here for you to see. So this is a fungal infection caused by, caused by C. albicans in the nail bed. And these individuals are very prone to getting these fungal infections because they don't have Dectin-1. Now, kind of in a poetic way and by far this is not satisfactory, I should point out that CARD9 mutations also results in very poor production of uh, TH17 cells and again is associated with severe susceptibility to um, chronic mucocutaneous candiasis. And um, what I'm saying is this is poetic because remember the Dectin-1 does actually signal through CARD9, but lots of other pathogen recognition receptors use CARD9. So this doesn't prove the importance of Dectin-1. It just proves that downstream, there's still the importance of CARD9 to protect against fungal infections. And now I'm going to switch to another lectin. And this is Dectin-2. And this is one of these life's little ironies and the misnaming of proteins. You'd think that Dectin-1 and Dectin-2 are related, right? One, two, should be similar. Actually, they're not. So just to clarify, Dectin-1 is calcium independent, and Dectin-2 actually binds in a calcium dependent manner, and they actually see different ligands. So this guy, as I said to you, beta-glucans, this is alpha-mannan. But in a stroke of sheer luck, while well, they are not structurally related, they do actually share some of um, the functions. So if you can see here, Dectin-1, Dectin-2 recognizes many pathogens, one of which happens to be yeast the candida albicans right here, just like Dectin-1. So Dectin-2 is expressed on myeloid cells, DCs, macrophages, and monocytes. As I mentioned, it's, um, it recognizes high mannose structures, specifically alpha mannans found in fungal cell walls. And 
and it's a little different than Dectin 1 in that it can't directly signal. But uh, here is its pathway, and I just want you to focus on this part that I highlighted. And basically, it signals through an adapter molecule. So that's the FC receptor common gamma chain that it attaches to, and it's through this attachment that Dectin can actually be expressed on the surface, and it's required for downstream signaling. All right, so Dectin-2 was shown to be essential in protection against C. albicans. And again, it promotes inflammatory responses, particularly the formation of Th17 helper cells. And when you looked at the Dectin-2 knockout mice, they're very susceptible to succumbing to this uh, fungal infection. There'll be increased fungal burden and, of course, rapid death. This brings me to the second part of the talk where we switch from directly activating more to a module, having a modulation function. And you can see that this is actually overlapping. They can do both. The first example I have is of DC sign. So I don't know whether you've heard of DC sign, but DC sign is expressed on um, human myeloid cells, particularly in certain dendritic cell subsets found in the mucosa and in the skin. It's been implicated as a susceptibility factor in infection with HIV because the, HIV, um, the virion actually binds to DEC205 and probably gains access into the dendritic cells, which then rapidly go to the draining lymph node, present the, uh, the virus to the CD4 T cells and result <coughs> in propagating infection. But that's not the role of the DC sun that I want to talk to about here. I want to talk to its role as a pathogen recognition receptor. So, DC sign is a classical lectin. It has the EPN motive and it binds calcium, it requires to bind calcium for binding of its targets. And look at how many different molecules. The other thing I want to highlight is that DC sign actually binds um, ICAM2 and ICAM3, so it binds its own self molecule and it may play a totally different role in that interaction. So, it's not just pathogens that it can recognize. The important thing is that DC sign can induce RAF1 phosphorylation, which then subsequently modulates TLR-induced NF-kappa-B activation. And this is how it looks like. So you've got DC sign on the surface, and you've got other TLR ligands, such as TLR4, on the surface as well. You've got various pathogens. They'll engage DC sign and result in activation of RAF1. But it's their interaction with a TLR ligand that results in the activation, sorry, in in the direction of NF-kappa B, but um, by releasing P65 from its inhibitor, which then translocates into the nucleus, which can then meet up with the activated RAF1. And this results um, in RAF1 inducing phosphorylation and acetylation of P65, and ultimately resulting in enhanced and prolonged transcription, which presumably then results in better cytokine production so on its own, it can't do anything. It does require the signaling via the TLRs to amplify that signal. So this is a nice example where TLR triggering of NF-kappa B um, occurs, but it's DC sign that provides extra information about the pathogen, presumably cost, um, customizing the immune response. It's possibly also an explanation why when DC sign binds its own self ligand, such as ICAM2, it doesn't induce um, cytokine production because there is no TLR um, signaling to activate the NF-kappa B pathway. The problem I have with this data, and this is being the devil's advocate and alerting you to be a bit critical about when reading about any molecule, really, is that we don't have an adequate model um, for DC sign in the mouse. There are two very similar molecules in the human, DC sign and DC sign R1, but in the mouse there's about six of them. And, and unfortunately, none of them uh, mimic DC sign closely enough to um, serve as functional homologues. So whilst it's nice to have this idea that DC sign can in fact modulate TLR signaling, it's very difficult to conclusively prove that there's a biological relevance to any of this. What we are waiting for are individuals that don't have functional DC sign and then analyzing them and seeing how they respond 
um, to different pathogens or the history of responding to different pathogens. And I've done a literature search on this and I couldn't find any such individual to date. There are mutations in DC sign and they can affect susceptibility to HIV infection. But again, I think that even that data is still to be totally clear. Now I'm going to switch to a different kind of collaboration. Um, and this is a collaboration that Dectin 1 has with many different TLRs um, for creating optimal cytokine production and in a respiratory burst. But the one that I want to focus on, because it poetically makes sense to me, is its collaboration with TLR2. It's also the one that there is most information on. So it doesn't just make sense to me, but there's a lot of data on it. So the reason it makes sense to me is this. TLR2 can actually recognize a diverse group of pathogens. It can recognize fungus, it can recognize bacteria, and it can recognize viruses. So it makes sense to have another molecule that it collaborates with that tells you, yes, I've seen a fungus too, okay? Because then you have two different receptors that are indicating that have overlapping recognition and that over overlapping recognition happens to be fungal uh, moieties. And um, so they should collaborate. And this is what they do. The first point of the collaboration is that engagement of Dectin-1 and TLR2 will result in enhanced production of IL-10, 6, and IL-23 by dendritic cells. And I actually wanted to show this data to you. Um, this is a publication, and I've referenced it here. But basically, these are different concentrations of the TLR2 ligand. And um, this is a steady state of um, beta-glucan, which is the ligand for Dectin-1, which results in its activation. And you can see there's a synergistic um, effect of adding the beta-glucan that you have when you have stimulation with a TR2 ligand in terms of IL-23 production. The other um, very cute thing is in this particular model, and it really speaks to modulation, is that when Dectin-1 is engaged, there is actually a suppression of TLR2-mediated IL-12 production, and this is what this looks like. So you have TLR2 stimulus here, different concentrations, and without beta-glucan, there's a nice IL-12 production. But if you add beta-glucan to the mix, and all of a sudden you blunt this IL-12 response. And I guess the idea is that by manipulating the cytokine production, by dendritic cells, you are then actually pushing for the development of Th17 cells, and you still have Th1 cells being induced, but more so you have Th17, and these are the ones that are supposed to be protect, protective against fungal infections. Okay, so my third example of collaboration is a totally different concept. And now we're looking at Dectin-2 and Dectin-3 collaborating to fight uh, C. albicans still. In a stroke of sheer brilliance, Dectin-3 and Dectin-2 are actually related and probably belong to the same family. But we want to make this difficult for you. And to do that, in the literature, it's actually not called Dectin-3. It's called CLEC-CSF8. So you have multiple names for molecules just to keep it interesting. They both recognize the alpha menons. And what's interesting is that Dactin is required for the protection against the albicans. So the knockout animals have an increased fungal burden and increased death rates. And I want you to have a look at what that data actually looks like. And the way that the people have done this experiment is they have inoculated mice with a C. albicans, and then they've blocked Dectin-2, or they've blocked Dectin-3 using monoclonal antibodies, or used a non-specific antibody that doesn't block the receptors. And what you see here is that when you block either Dectin-2 or Dectin-3, the animals are no longer protected and they succumb to the disease. And why this is kind of cute is because Dectin-3 apparently forms these heterodimers with Dectin-2, facilitating a higher sensitivity for, sensitivity for the detection of C. albicans, C. little flowers here. And what that's supposed to do is it's supposed to facilitate better binding, better activation, better cytokine output, and hopefully this collaboration ends up 
why they can fight um, C. albicans better. And this brings me to my very third function that lectins may play, and that is not in activation per se, but in directing cargo for antigen presentation. I'd like to introduce you to clac 9 a but I'll do so by giving you a little bit of context. So our lab, well, when I was in Ken Shortman's lab, uh, we really focused on trying to understand the biology of CD8 positive DCs because these are very, very special subset of DCs. What's special about them relevant to this talk is their unprecedented capacity for cross-presentation. That is, they can grab something from the outside and somehow, still not clear how, they can shuttle that into the class one presentation pathway and present it in class one and therefore activate CD8 T cells. An extension of that capacity is the ability of the CD8 positive DCs to grab dead cells and anything that's associated with the dead cells facilitate cross-presentation of those antigens. And just how important CD8 positive DCs are in cross-presentation was illustrated by a paper um, by Ken Murphy's group where they knocked out BAT-F3, which happens to be a transcription factor, very important in generating CD8 family, CD8 positive DCs family. So they effectively knocked out the CD8 positive DCs. And what they saw was that these cells couldn't, con couldn't cross-present properly they were much more susceptible to viral infections, and they were much more susceptible to tumors. Okay, so this brings us to clac 9 a We wanted to understand the biological basis for why CD8 positive DCs were so unique, and we wanted better markers. So we started cloning anything that was on CD8 positive DCs, and we came up with clac 9 a And in fact, three other, two other groups did at the same time. CLEC9A belongs to the group five of C-type lectins, and basically that means that binding of its target was predicted to be independent of calcium. The other cute thing about CLEC9A is that it's got these ITAM-like motifs, exactly like the ones you saw in Dectin 1, so potentially it should be um, activatory. As I mentioned to you, it's expressed on CD8 positive disease. I mean, that's where we cloned it from. But it's also expressed on plasma cytodesis. And I won't talk at all about plasma cytodesis, not because I'm ignoring them, but because we have yet to date never found a function of CLEC9A in the plasma cytodesis. So it's not just us. No one has at this point. So until they do, this is a mute point. I don't know why it's expressed on plasma cytodesis. One of the very, very interesting things about clac 9 a that I don't think people even appreciate fully is that really it's one of the only markers that I know that is faithfully only represented on dendritic cells, on CD8 positives and the PDCs here. Other cell types really don't express this lectin. And that is, that's unique for its specificity. Even CD11C, which is the marker that we all use to identify um, DCs in, in the mouse, it's actually very broadly expressed. It's not DC specific per se. It's just that DCs have more of it. So CLEC9A is unique. The other great thing about CLEC9A turns out to be that it has a human homologue, which speaks of the importance that it may play because it's conserved between mouse and man. And the other good thing is it's not just conserved, but its expression pattern is. So it's expressed on the BDCA3 population of um, human dendritic cells, and this is the equivalent of the CD8 positive in the mouse. That was a very good hint to us that this molecule was going to be important. Things are not conserved when they're not important. Now, clac 9 i has another name, and it's called DNGR1. And if you say that really, really fast, you come up with danger one. And I can tell you why in a minute. So turns out that we really hit the jackpot when we started working with clac 9 a because it actually is one of the things that binds dead cells. So this is data by my colleague Mirela Hood, and she basically has dead cells here and mouse dead cells. And you can see these dead cells here bind soluble clac 9 really, really, really well, whereas another lectin does not. And um, Caetano Rhesus showed this first, but we certainly had the data at the same time. Just he scooped us. It's all sad. Um, so clac 9 a is an endocytic receptor, but interestingly, it's actually redundant for phagocytosis. And this is an important point because it is not redundant for cross-presentation of dead cells. And this is data presented by um, Kitana Rizzo-Suse. 
So here we have a situation where CLAC 9A is not important for getting the stuff in, but once it's in, it becomes important because CLAC 9A does something that facilitates the priming of CD8 T cells. And this is um, Caetano's data that I'd like to show you. Basically, when you create a CLAC 9A blockade and prevent cross-presentation, you induce very, very few CD8 positive um, T cells seen as in tetramastaining, compared to animals that have a full functioning clac 9 a that can help cross-presentation. So how does it do it? Well, the number one candidate is this. It's sick signaling, the idea that it's got this perfectly wonderful motif that works brilliantly in dect dectin-1. So maybe clac 9 a serves to activate um, DCs. Well, Caetano has looked really, really, really hard because that's why he called it danger one. He wanted it to be a danger molecule. And unfortunately, to date, there is no evidence whatsoever that clac 9 a on dendritic cells serves to activate DCs. There is no activation that we can tell that's clac 9 a dependent. In a twist of fate, sick may in fact be important for cross-presentation, but precisely how that plays itself out hasn't been yet clarified. So here we are, we have a dilemma. On the one hand, we've got clac 9 a facilitating cross-presentation of dead cell-associated antigen, but, they're not actually, but it's not actually activatory. How does it do it? Well, the answer lies most probably in how it handles its antigen. So when it grabs the cargo, it does something that facilitates the cargo to end up in the early endosomes and in the uh, recycling compartments. And that's important because both of those compartments have been associated with better antigen presentation and better cross-presentation. So somehow, clac 9 a facilitates this process. We wanted to understand exactly what clac 9 a bound. Okay, it binds dead cells, but you know, what on dead cells does it bind? And that is the work done by Mireille Lahoud that I'm pinching and showing. And basically, Murray's work shows that um, clac 9 a recognizes a cytoskeletal protein. Here, it's associated with spectrin, but not actin itself. And this becomes important in a minute, and I'll show you why. She then went on to, to um, show that clac 9 a actually binds filamentous actin. So here you have dead cell binding phylloidin. Phylloidin actually binds filamentous actin, and you can see it in red. And here you see binding of soluble mouse clac 9 a and you can see that it looks identical. So in fact, when you superimpose the two colors, it turns yellow, and that means that it's co-localized, that the same cells are express or same components are expressing bo um, binding both dyes. In other words, clac 9 a recognizes filamentous actin. Now, if you don't know what filamentous actin is, neither did I. It's actually a very, very, very complex molecule. It's made up of these little um, dots here, which is actually G, it's actually G actin, it's called globular actin. And these polymerize, making these filaments occur. And lots and lots of proteins are associated with filamentous actin. About 150 different proteins can associate with actin. This is a very, very busy molecule. And the other thing that's really important to highlight is that F-actin is normally always expressed within the cell. It's part of the cytoskeleton. Um, and it isn't normally visible unless there is loss of membrane integrity. When things burst open, for example, then F-actin becomes exposed. Okay. Now, F-actin is critical to just about everything because it's cytoskeletal, it's involved in motility, in adhesion, in locomotion, in chromatome remodeling. I think it's probably easier to say what it's not involved in than what it's involved in. And you know, when something is really, really important and it underpins a lot of cellular processes, then you know that viruses are going to be exploiting it, they're going to jump in, and they're going to be using the cytoskeleton for their own needs of propagation. So it's not surprising then that you'll have viruses associated with filamentous actin. But they pay a price for hijacking our system. And that is, cytos cytopathic viruses will lyse the cell that they've infected. And when they lyse that cell, filamentous actin becomes visible. And clac 9 a can recognize the filamentous actin and anything that's associated with it. 
all those 150 proteins that tag along are now getting sucked up by the DCs and are going into the cross-presentation pathway. Then it's not surprising at all that um, Caetano went ahead and showed that CLEC9A mediates cross-priming of cytotoxic T cells during vaccinia virus infection. The first piece of data that he has here, looking at the induction of CD8 T cells that produce interferon gamma, um, here is the wild-type mice that have got CLEC9A. This is the kind of response that they can produce, whereas um, the CLEC9A knockouts are much inhibited in the kind of CD8 T cell response that they can launch against the different vaccinia bar, um, proteins here, two different types of proteins that they've measured. Now, what about the actual viral infection? Does it, rend, does it give you protection to have CLEC9A? The answer is yes, but let me walk you through that data. This is really important. So at the initial state, in the first seven days, you don't actually have enough CD8 T cells to protect you. There is still clonal expansion going on and the acquisition of killer function, okay? So in the first instance, you actually require your innate immune system to protect you against the viral invasion. And in that first short window, you don't need CLEC9A for that protection. That's innate protection. But later on, when you are actually relying on your cytotoxic T cells to kill virus-infected cells, you do require CLEC9A. And if you don't have CLEC9A, the viral titers are much higher than when you do have CLEC9A. And this translates into um, a slower, a lag period in resolving the viral infection. Here they could measure the lesion diameter. And like you see, in the first seven days, the mice have got equal lesions. But then the ones that have CLEC9A resolve the infection quicker than the ones that don't have CLEC9A. I know it looks like a moderate response, but thank God it's a moderate response because you would not want to be dependent on one molecule to protect you against all viruses. So there has to be redundancy in the system. You are only looking for small changes, which are significant. Okay, so to summarize CLEC9A. CLEC9A, what happens is when you are virally infected, at some point or another, if the virus is cytopathic, there will be rupture. With the rupture comes the exposure of F-actin. F-actin acts a little bit like a fishing net. It has trapped all kinds of proteins in the scaffolding, including viral proteins, which then can quickly be taken up and shuttled into cross-presentation via CLEC9A for the activation of CD8 T cells. The added bonus of this very clever system is that DCs can sample without actually being infected themselves. And you think about how good that is, because you know that viruses that infect APCs can totally mess with uh, antigen presentation. So this is giving the DCs a short window of opportunity where they can present antigen that they themselves have actually not been infected with. Might be very significant under circumstances. And now I'm going to switch topics all together, and I'm going to go to DEC205. It's a very complex molecule, but it's going to be another nice example of shuttling stuff around in the cell and how important lectins can be. So this is one of those big ones. It has 10 acetyl lectin like domains. It's got various motifs. It's conserved between species. Mouse and man both have DEC205. And again, as soon as I see conservation, I think, ooh, it must actually mean something. And it's expressed on many, many different cell types. But it's famous for its expression on CD8-positive DCs because it's very high on these cells. Not to be ignored, though, it is on other DCs, including T and B cells and various other cell types. Its function is actually still unknown. But I can paint some pictures for you. First of all, it's very clear that it's a superb, superb endocytic receptor. It is so good at doing that, at picking stuff up and shuttling it inside, that people have called it an antigen uptake receptor. And they've called it this because what they've done is they've delivered antigen to DEC205 and then seen this exquisite antigen presentation. So let me show you how they've done that. So basically, that's your DC, that's your DEC205, uh, DEC and they've created an antibody against DEC205, and then they've placed cargo here. And what happens is the cargo is taken up and it's cross-presented and you have beautiful activation of CD8 T cells. And 
A measurement of CD8 T cells is their ability to kill, cytotoxic killing. And here is what you see when you target antigen to DEC205. This is, you get nearly 100% killing in this assay, whereas if you don't target that antigen, this is in vivo, this is injecting mice, right? You get barely any killing at all. So it's an exquisite antigen presenting um, receptor. But the antibody itself doesn't actually activate DEC205. It cross-links it, but it doesn't activate it. And yet still we have this really good antigen presentation. So we have ourselves a parallel case exactly to what we saw in clec 9 It's not the activation of the receptor that is important, but it's what the receptor does after it grabs the antigen. And so in dec 5s case, it handles this in such a way that it promotes cross-presentation and actually presentation in general. As a side note of things to consider, dec 5 has been shown to be involved in HIV binding, I say that loosely, and also plasminogen activity <coughs> of Serenia pestis. Now, this is not direct binding, this is indirect binding that they've shown. So I think still much data needs to be out there before we can absolutely um, convincingly say that DEC205 directly binds a HIV or plasminogen activator for that matter and res um, resolves in its uptake. The other thing that you find in the literature is that DEC205 apparently binds narcotic and apoptotic cells. Now, I can categorically say that we have exhaustively looked at this, because I'd like it to, but we cannot corroborate this data. In our hands, DEC205 does not bind dead cells. Okay, but what it does bind in our hands, and this is kind of an interesting discovery on a side note, it actually binds synthetic CPG oligonucleotides. And not only does it bind them, but it grabs them and shuttles them into the cell. So how we discovered this, or how we documented this, is we, we took CPG, and this is fluorescinated labeled. Then we injected it into animals, and 30 minutes later, we pulled out the spleen, purified the DCs, and looked to see whether they had the actual CPG. Now, let me walk you through this. The background staining, so mice that didn't receive any injections, is here. If you have DEC205 like wild type mice do, then all of a sudden you can see the these CD8 positive DCs fluorescinating. But if you don't have DEC205 in the gray here, as a knockout doesn't have DEC205, then you don't seem to take up the CPG anywhere near as well. And that's very, very clear by confocal microscopy, um, where this, this, um, this is not just binding on the cell surface, but it actually is uh, internalizing that CPG into this uh, vesicles you can see in the red. I hope you can see in the red. And you don't see this at all in the knockout mice. And then if you look further, these vesicles actually co-localize with MHC class 2. Well, some of them do. And this work was done by Simon Muta. So, DEC205 serves to shuttle CPG to TLR9, because you absolutely require TLR9 to respond to CPG, but what DEC205 seems to do, it seems to grab the CPG and shuttle it into TLR9. I'd like to say that this biological role is to capture DNA and deliver it to TLR9, but that would be a fallacy, because I'm going to let you in on a dirty little secret that most people don't fully appreciate. Synthetic oligonucleotides mimic normal DNA only so much. You have to keep in mind that they're phosphorothioated and they're single-stranded, and our DNA and that of bacteria is phosphodiester DNA, and it's double-stranded, it's the helix. So whilst there are some similarity between the pharmacon that we all use to vaccinate mice with, there are also some profound differences, one of which is that um, normal DNA doesn't seem to bind DEC205. So I'm not exactly sure what the role of DEC205 is, or whether it really can, under some circumstances, bind DNA or not. But I can say that whatever it binds, it gets it to TLR9, it gets it to the endolysosomes. So I think the point that we can make is that in this, that DEC205 acts as a receptor to take things up, in the case of CPG, that ends up being the compartment where TLR9 is and is required for optimal responses to CPG. So DEC205 is important if you want full responses. Um, 
But whether or not DEC-205 is a true pathogen recognition receptor, I don't know. I think maybe, but I think we still need to wait for conclusive proof. In any case, it makes a good case that it can deliver cargo to various different compartments, including the endolysosomes, and including those compartments that are very much involved in cross-presentation. So I think it'll turn out that DEC-205 is going to be important in shuttling whatever it grabs to these different compartments. So now to conclude, so cisablectins as pathogen recognition receptors, um, they're a diverse group that can bind many different types of ligands. I think they can directly activate or they can modulate. Alternatively, they can simply act as way of delivering cargo to the right compartments to facilitate different processes, whether it's activation, like in the case of DEC-205 via TLR9, or whether it's antigen presentation. And despite the fact that there is such a great overlap between um, the type of recognition that c lectins facilitate, there are examples where it's clear that it's not redundant, so that they do play a very specific role in innate and subsequent adaptive immune responses. And that's me. Very clear presentation and uh, miraculously nicely followed on from the TLR talk of, of last week. So uh, the organisers obviously miraculously got something right there. <laughs> um, it was so good. I'm not sure you are going to have any questions, but are there any? Yes? Naive question. So when you were talking about Quest 9A, um, you are talking about that it recognises the act, that specific kind of act in the complex. So does it only hang around cells that are ruptured by viruses, or does it pretty much hang around any cell that's dying? Clactin A is expressed on the surface of CD8 positive DCs. So the role that it would serve is that if anything ruptures, it is almost like um, the F-actin behaves like a black box of a crashing plane. As the thing disintegrates, the F-actin is the black box, and the black box is caught by Clactin A, which says, what did you see when you died? Okay, and chances are, it's not gonna just show you the proteins that it saw, but it's gonna give you all other danger signals that come with viral, viral pathogens. And it's gonna activate the DCs and have fabulous cross-presentation. Yeah. Well, you're all thinking of the questions. I'll follow up with a couple. Um, I thought, you know, you've nicely said there are kind of three groups, the signaling, uh, uh, and, and for example, the, the final endocytic one and a modifying one. Uh, Those are the three classes. Do you think that maybe is a little bit simplistic? Because as things are signaling, they can still be taken in and Absolutely. they can still be being presented. Absolutely. I think it is simplistic, and you have to keep in mind that these have overlapping functions. And I try to illustrate that in the case of Dectin 1, where it's not just directly activating, it's also phagocytosing. It's getting this stuff in. Okay, yeah. and of course, once you phagocytose something, there's probably going to be antigen presentation as a consequence, otherwise the immune system would be done, right? Yeah. So, yes, there's overlapping functions. It's more like specializations, what they excel at, or what they seem to be most important at. Yeah. Peter? That was great to read it. So, um, this net theory, with the actin being, uh, the filament stacked and just dragging everything in with it, is there any evidence that it gets depolymerized once it gets in the cell? Well, okay. To release I, its, you know, to unfold the net. Yeah, well, I think sooner or later it's going to get degraded. Forget the depolymerization. It's going to get chopped up because it has to get chopped up because that's how the immune system presents class one and class two. It presents peptides of proteins. So sooner or later it has to be degraded. The idea is that you maximize degradation such and you couple that with antigen presentation. But you might depolymerize it in other ways, right? You might just yes. turn it back into G active. You could. So I don't know. I mean, usually experiments do, right? See what's happening in terms of the G actin once it gets uptaken. Well, we know from your race data that G actin doesn't get uh, doesn't bind to 9A. No, no, but once it gets in, does oh, it once it gets in, to G right? Yes, it could. But once it's in, it's in. Its job is pretty much hopefully done. Well, yes. Seth, and then uh, you mentioned that the mice who lack. 
Infectin 1 have specificity in terms of the type of fungal infection? Yes. So why it might be uh, yes. specific for ones that are low for chitin? Yes. And have they looked in the patients who lack Infectin 1 to find out if their particular uh, fungus infection is the same ones that are low in chitin? I, I'm almost certain that they did not. Um, I'd have to go back to the original publication of the family of four individuals to see what they had done, what strain they identified as. But I'm almost certain that they wouldn't have looked because the publication that then actually clarified why Dectin 1 was important against one um, uh, albicans and not the other, that was uh, just last year. So they can point it. So there was no point for the one in 2009 to identify kitten, kitten, whatever it is. Do you think amoxicillin could be a possible target to enhance vaccines to help target the antibodies to like to that would be my work. cells? That would, <laughs> <laughs> that would actually be my work. Um, <laughs> yes, NK kinds too, of course. So that's exactly what we want to do. And there's nothing unique in that. I think that as soon as something is endocytic and has capacity to facilitate cross presentation then it becomes a hot, hot target for exploitation. So what we have done is we've delivered a lot of antigens to Plat Banay, and yes, of course, it does really great um, cross-presentation. It's on par with DEC205, but it has the additional benefit of the specificity that it's only on DCs, where DEC205 uh, DEC is on so many other cell types. Um, and it has all kinds of biological um, peculiarities which I'm working on. But that's another talk. <laughs> Um, CD8 DCs, great talk, Harry, but um, CD8 DCs are in kind of only a few areas in the body. Um, so going back to Keeley's question, they're not kind of everywhere looking for dead cells, so they've got to get there somehow. Is there any... A feeling of how that would happen. I mean, it's not just CD8 positive DCs that express plaque 9 a it's a CD8 positive family of DCs, so you know, it's a CD103, it's the traffickers, right? So they would be in a position where there would be potential damage of sort that they need to monitor. Plus, I mean, I guess, you know, there will be a lot of noise when you have viral infection. I think there's also some evidence that um, macrophages come and hand over cargo. Macrophages handing over cargo, that's lovely. I've only known for DCs handing over cargo. <laughs> I'm all good with that, handing over cargo. I'm um, just following on Peter's question just now. I'm not, might be just naive questions. Um, does the environment in the endocytic, uh, endocytotic vesicles is feasible for depolymerization, polymerization of actin? Because it's like a pH dependent, you know? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. That's a really good question. I, I actually don't know under which conditions we would have depolymerization and whether it could occur in the endosomes, for example, yes. or the early endosomes, or wherever the different pHs. I think that's definitely something that we're going to be looking at uh, in the future. And actually, Mirai my colleague is working on on everything to do with shuttling because it's, this is actually much, a small picture of a much much more complicated story. Um, you know, what does it do when it binds the ligand? What does it do when it doesn't bind the ligand? What, you know, how does it recirculate? And then there is an endogenous ligand that uh, probably works to regulate its function as well. And how all of that comes together, whether there's polymerization or depolymerization, I think it will come out in the next few years. I think it's worth exploring this, uh, which is obviously an attractive concept that you put forward, is that uh, F-acting um, is, is like a net and it can carry along a lot of viral proteins which are, which are going to be found there. And you're saying that you find dead cells. And, and my immediate thought when I, uh, is that perhaps the dead cell is, is um, dead cell binding is perhaps a little bit experimentally artifactual. I mean, if a virus is shedding out of uh, dead cells, they're, they're going to be released. Absolutely. And I wonder whether you know you kill thousands of cells, stick them on, and sure enough, there's some effecting that's available. But I'm wondering what whether you would whether you're a strong proponent of the mm -hmm. fact that they're actually directly binding effecting that they would kind of have to get into the membrane and get get through holes in the membrane. I think. To bind, I think. Or that is it released? I, I think I'm really focusing on the cytopathic viruses, the yeah. ones that don't, we're, not, we're talking about the things bust open and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the inside that shouldn't be coming out, that is coming out. Yeah. So I think in that scenario, you're likely to have a release. And the fact that Tatana could actually show um, that there was an impact and he looked at different strains of viruses, some that are more reliant on cross-presentation than others. So it's still circumstantial. This is very difficult to prove, mm -hmm. but 
circumstantial evidence supports the role that platinum may in fact pick up debris and thereby present viral antigen. It is circumstantial, it's not proven beyond doubt. If there are no other questions, that just makes sense. Thank you very much.